In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By the immaculate conception of Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By the Immaculate Conception of Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My Mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By the Immaculate Conception of Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, today is the 17th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2021. And in the universal calendar for today, we celebrate the feast of St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, also known as St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, Bishop and Confessor. The reading from today's Martyrology for the 17th of November. At Neo Caesarea in Pontus, the birthday of St. Gregory, Bishop and Confessor, illustrious for his learning and sanctity the signs and miracles which he wrought to the glory of the church gained for him the surname Wonder Worker. In Lincoln, St. Hugh, Bishop, who was called to rule the church of Lincoln, he ended his holy life in peace, renowned for many miracles. And at Cordova in Spain, during the persecution of Diocletian, the holy martyrs Achisclus and his sister Victoria, who were most cruelly tortured by order of the governor Dion, and thus merited to be crowned by our Lord for their glorious sufferings, and in other places many other holy martyrs, confessors, and virgins. Deo gratias. Well, once again, I'd like to extend joyful greetings to each and every one of you who are watching or listening to this live stream mission being broadcast 
on the island of Papastronzi. And I'd like to thank you for prayers that you may have offered for me and my confreres. I was back about two months ago, I was recently ordained to the level of the subdiaconic, along with three of my confreres, and then one Father Peter Mary who's ordained to the priesthood, all in the same ceremony. And it is a joy once again to be able to be here to continue this live stream mission. And I ask also for your prayers that I may, for my perseverance and those of my confreres. The first notice for today is taken from the Glories of Mary by our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus. The first part, on the Salve Regina. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Section three, on the greatness of the love which this mother bears us. From this arises another motive for the love of Mary towards us. For in us, she beholds that which has been purchased at the price of the death of Jesus Christ. If a mother knew that a servant had been ransomed by a beloved son at the price of 20 years of imprisonment and suffering, how greatly would she esteem that servant if on this account alone? Mary well knows that her son came into the world only to save us poor creatures, as he himself protested. I am come to save that which was lost, St. Luke. And to save us, he was pleased even to lay down his life for us, having become obedient unto death, Philippians. If then Mary loved us but little, she would show that she valued but little the blood of her son, which was the price of our salvation. To St. Elizabeth of Hungary, it was revealed that Mary, from the time she dwelt in the temple, did nothing but pray for us, begging that God would hasten the coming of his son into the world to save us. And how much more must we suppose that she loves us, now that she has seen that we are valued to such a degree by her son, that he did not disdain to purchase us at such a cost. And because all men have been redeemed by Jesus, therefore Mary loves and protects them all. It was she who was seen by St. John in the Apocalypse, clothed with the sun. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. She is said to be clothed with the sun because as there is no one on earth who can be hidden from the heat of the sun, there is no one that can hide himself from his heat, Psalms. So there is no one living who can be deprived of the love of Mary. From its heat, that is, as the blessed Raymond Giordano applies the words, from the love of Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> the second notice for today is taken from the work by our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus, on prayer as the great means of obtaining salvation and all graces. Why God delays granting us final perseverance. But, some one will say, since God can give and wishes to give me the grace of perseverance, why does he not give it to me all at once when I ask him? The Holy Fathers assign many reasons. First, God does not grant it at once 
but delays it. First, that he may better prove our confidence. Second, and further, says St. Augustine, that we may long for it more vehemently. Third, again, the Lord does so, that we may not forget him. If we were already secure of persevering and of being saved, and if we had not continual need of God's help to preserve us in his grace and to save us, we should soon forget God. Want makes the poor keep resorting to the houses of the rich. So God, to draw us to himself, as St. Chrysostom says, and to see us often at his feet, in order that he may thus be able to do us greater good, delays giving us the complete grace of salvation till the hour of our death. It is not because he rejects our prayers that he delays, but by this contrivance he wishes to make us careful and to draw us to himself. Again, he does so in order that we, by persevering in prayer, may unite ourselves closer to him with the sweet bonds of love. Prayer, says the same Saint Chrysostom, which is accustomed to converse with God, is no slight bond of love to him. This continual recurrence to God in prayer and this confident expectation of the graces which we desire from him, oh, what a great spur and chain is it of love to inflame us and to bind us more closely to God. But till what time have we to pray? Always, says the same saint, till we receive favorable sentence of eternal life. That is to say, till our death. Do not leave off till you receive. And he goes on to say that the man who resolves, I will never leave off praying, till I am saved, will most certainly be saved. If you say, I will not give in till I have received, you will assuredly receive. The apostle writes that many run for the prize, but that he only receives it who runs till he wins. Know ye not that they who run in the race, all run indeed, but, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. It is not then enough simply, or it is not then enough for salvation simply to pray, but we must pray always that we may come to receive the crown which God promises, but promises only to those who are constant in prayer till the end. So that if we wish to be saved, we must do as David did, who always kept his eyes turned to God, to implore his aid against being overcome by his enemies. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the snare. As the devil does not cease continually spreading snares to swallow us up, as St. Peter writes, your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour, so ought we ever to stand with our arms in our hands to defend ourselves from such a foe, and to say with the royal prophet, I will pursue after my enemies, and I will not turn again till they are consumed. I will never cease fighting till I see my enemies conquered. But how can we obtain this victory so important for us and so difficult? By most persevering prayers, says St. Augustine, only by prayers, and those most persevering, and till when, as long as the fight shall last. As the battle is never over, says St. Bonaventure, so let us never give over asking for mercy. As we must always be in the combat, so should we be always asking God for aid not to be overcome. Woe, says the wise man, to him who in this battle leaves off praying. Woe to them that have lost patience. We may be saved, the apostle tells us, but on this condition. 
if we retain firm confidence in the glory of hope until the end, if we are constant in praying with confidence until death. And that third point that our Holy Father St. Alphonsus raises, that third reason for delaying this final perseverance on is really shows the difference between the Catholic faith and a lot of Protestant religions. A lot of Protestant religions hold that once you make this once and for all act of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior, you're saved. You are going to make it. You will not be damned. But it's just not how it is. We know as Catholics that our salvation is not certain. We know it hangs in the balance. We are hanging in the balance, and it's we need the graces every day to be able to live a life that will dispose us in such a way that we will die as we have lived. So this grace of perseverance is a grace not to be asked for once, but that we need to keep remembering to pray for. So after these notices, we'll have the five decades of the Holy Rosary. That will then be followed by the breastplate prayer of St. Patrick and the exorcism against Satan and the apostate angels. And then that will be followed by devotions, which will include prayers to St. Joseph and prayers for the poor souls in purgatory. And now for the main notice. So today's saint, St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, also known as St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, was born and raised in a pagan family in a town called Neo Caesarea in on the, um, the coast of the Black Sea in the northern part of what is now called uh, modern-day Turkey. When he was 14 years old, his father died. And that shook him up a bit and led him to gradually come to realize the vanity and emptiness of this world and of paganism. St. Gregory's mother encouraged him to take on a legal career to study literature and to and rhetoric and Latin in the hopes that one day he would be an excellent advocate in the law courts. And he worked hard. He devoted himself to his studies and he excelled, especially in rhetoric to the point where he it looked like he would become one of possibly one of the greatest public speakers of his day. His sister eventually got married to a governor of Palestine. And so he, St. Gregory, and his brother Athenodorus accompanied her there in order to be able to carry on their studies. So they're in Caesarea in Palestine. And shortly after they arrived, the, the famous theologian Origen arrived in Caesarea and set up a school. St. Gregory and his brother soon enrolled as students under him. And Origen found these two brothers 
very well disposed towards the practice of virtue and endowed with a great capacity for learning. Beginning with logic, Origen taught the two brothers to thoroughly examine an argument before accepting or rejecting it. From there, he went on to teach them natural philosophy, drawing them to adore God and to admire him and his power as could be seen in the works of creation. Origen also taught these two students mathematics and astronomy, all the while skillfully using this opportunity to raise their minds and hearts to God and to love for the truth. He gave them lectures on morality, and St. Gregory says that he led more by example than by speech in this regard. He also showed these two brothers what the various pagan philosophers and poets had said about God and to what extent human reason was inadequate to speak about God. From there, he went on to teach them about the revealed word of God in the scriptures. And St. Gregory and his brother both took all of this in like a sponge. Eventually, they went on to become baptized, and both of them became bishops. St. Gregory's brother, Athenodorus, went on to suffer very much for the love of our Divine Redeemer, and St. Gregory himself would eventually go on to be a great shining light in his native town as the Bishop of Nea Caesarea. So they were studying on, under Origen for about three or four years, and this suddenly came to an end when a persecution broke out under Emperor Maximian, and Origen, who was quite famous, had to go into hiding. So St. Gregory, at this time, went on to Alexandria in Egypt, to a famous school of Platonic philosophy that was there. Among the various students that were there, he, he was one who lived one of the most strict, strictly moral lives. And some of the other students became quite jealous of him because of this, because he was a reproach to them. And so they decided to try and destroy his reputation. They hired a prostitute to go up to him and to demand a payment from him, as if he had committed a sin. And she did. So St. Gregory, in response, asked one of his friends to go get some money from him, some of his money, and to pay the lady in order to get her to leave him alone. This made some of his other friends, his loyal, loyal friends, think that he actually had committed sin. But God arranged that the truth should be known. As soon as the woman received the money, she was instantly possessed by a devil. She fell on the ground, rolling around, tore her hair, and started foaming at the mouth. And it was only at the prayers of St. Gregory that she was delivered from the devil. And in this way, the truth became known. Eventually, St. Gregory went back to Palestine and was able to study for two more years under Origen. Shortly after arriving back, Origen wrote a letter to the saint telling him to employ all his talents for the glory of God. He told him only to borrow from pagan philosophy what was useful, only what was useful, to serve 
this purpose, that is, the glory of God. Just as the Jews had used the spoils of the Egyptians to build the tabernacle of God. He encouraged St. Gregory to continue studying the scriptures and to keep up his prayer life. St. Gregory went back to his hometown of Neo Caesarea and sought to live a life of solitude. But this did not last very long. Archbishop Phidimus of Amasea summoned him to be consecrated bishop of Neo Caesarea. For a time, St. Gregory tried to hide in the desert, but eventually he had to accept the post. At this time, Neo Caesarea was still mostly pagan. So St. Gregory, filled with charity and zeal, vigorously worked to convert the people. And God allowed him to work many miracles in order to make this happen. So many that he received the name Tom Turgis, the wonder worker. To give just one of these wonders. One night, the saint got caught in a storm on his way back to the city. And the only shelter he could find was inside a pagan temple. So St. Gregory made the sign of the cross to purify the air, and he peacefully spent the night there. The next day, the pagan priest came in to do his sacrifices, but the devils would no longer speak to him because they had been chased away by St. Gregory and the sign of the cross. So the man ran after St. Gregory and caught up with him and threatened to complain to the emperor about him. St. Gregory calmly told him that with the help of God, he had been given power to command the demons. The pagan priest was quite impressed to hear about this, and he asked if St. Gregory could summon the demons back to the temple. So St. Gregory agreed and gave the man a note saying, Gregory to Satan, enter. The pagan priest laid this on the altar of the temple and the demons once again gave their answers to him as they had in the past. So the pagan priest ran back to St. Gregory and asked for instruction about the Catholic faith because he desired to know the God whom the devils obeyed. St. Gregory began to teach this pagan priest, but the pagan priest could not bring himself to accept the doctrine of the Incarnation. St. Gregory, noticing this, realized that, okay, you won't believe this through human reasoning. So the only way you will believe this is through the power of God. So the priest, the pagan priest, asked St. Gregory, see that stone over there? Could you command that stone to move? St. Gregory agreed. And after praying to our divine redeemer, the stone obeyed him and moved on its own. <clears throat> and this is just as our Lord had promised his disciples that their faith would move mountains. So also the prayers and faith of his servant St. Gregory enabled him to command the stone to move and it obeyed. And so by this point, the pagan priest was converted and gave up everything, his friends, his family, and his home, in order to become a Catholic. There are two points I'd like to share with you in connection with St. Gregory Tomaturgus. The first one arises from that most basic catechism question. What is the purpose of life? The purpose of life 
as we know, is to know, love, and serve God in this life and to share in his everlasting happiness in heaven. We are called to know God. We are called to spend eternity contemplating him. All other knowledge, all other education must be subordinated to this. If we do any other studies, this must be the ultimate end in view. And studies that lead away or detract from this end, the glory of God, are useless at best and very harmful to our souls at worst. So if you are undertaking any studies, raise your mind and heart to God in prayer as you do this. Be careful when studying works by secular or pagan authors. As Origen recommended to St. Gregory, take only what is good and in accord with the Catholic faith and useful to the glory of God. The second thing I'd like to share with you is St. Gregory's Declaration of Faith, a beautiful short profession of faith in the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. And this was revealed to St. Gregory in a vision by our Blessed Lady and by St. John the Evangelist. He says, There is one God, the Father of the living Word, who is his subsistent wisdom and power and eternal image, perfect begetter of the perfect begotten, Father of the only begotten Son, there is one Lord, only of the only, God of God, image and likeness of deity, efficient word, wisdom comprehensive of the constitution of all things, and power formative of the whole creation. True Son of true Father, invisible of invisible, and incorruptible of incorruptible, and immortal of immortal, and eternal of eternal. And there is one Holy Spirit, having his subsistence from God, and being made manifest by the Son, to wit to men, image of the Son, perfect image of the perfect, life, the cause of the living, holy fount, sanctity, the supplier or leader of sanctification, in whom is manifested God the Father, who is above all and in all, and God the Son, who is through all. There is a perfect trinity in glory and eternity and sovereignty, neither divided nor estranged. Wherefore, there is nothing either created or in servitude in the trinity, nor anything superinduced, as if at some former period it was non-existent, and at some later period it was introduced. And thus, neither was the Son ever wanting to the Father, nor the Spirit to the Son, but without variation and without change, the same Trinity abides forever. May our Divine Redeemer and our Mother Perpetual Sucker bless you abundantly. The Holy Rosary will follow in a few minutes. Let all we praise that fancy lot I praise and love the child. As far to your heart, whose tongue or word, whose hand no deed ye find. I praise him most, I love him best, I praise and love all his is. Love him, I love him, him I live and cannot love unless. Love's sweetest mark, love's highest gift. Most desired light to love in life to be. 